OK, so since I get to, to give the last talk of the week, I, I should uh, take the opportunity to thank the organizers for organizing this, this uh, great workshop. I really enjoyed hearing all the great talks. And uh, so uh, maybe let's thank the organizers. <laughs> And thanks, thanks uh, of course, even more to the audience that stayed for the whole, the whole week. <laughs> uh, it's much uh, harder to listen than it is to lecture, so I appreciate you listening. So I thought originally I had some plans to do some details of the uh, algorithmic complexity, but I realized that would be too technical for the last talk of the week. So I'll, I'll instead talk about three examples in uh, in computational topology today. So the first one, I want to finish what I started last time, which is to explain the idea behind these exponentially complicated disks with a not so complicated boundary, and how they imply these isoparametric inequalities for curves in R3. So let me just review quickly what we said last time. The, Classical isoparametric inequality has to do with curves in the plane or in general with co-dimension one surfaces in n dimension, like spheres in three space. But you can also ask about curves in higher dimensions. So for a curve in the, in the plane, you know that the area is less than the length squared over four pi. But what about if you have a curve in R3? So there's different ways to ask this question. One is, uh, so we have some fixed curve and we look for, say, the smallest surface filling in that curve, spanning that curve. And as that picture up there shows, if you have a disk, it may cross the curve. And if you allow it to cross the curve and have self-intersections, then Andre Weil proved that you can always get some disk whose area is less than L squared over 4 pi, the same as in the plane. And uh, the, if you don't want to allow the disk to cross itself, then you need, and you, allow, and you allow yourself to use surfaces of higher genus, then again you can prove it. It was proven by Blaschke. The area is less than L squared over 4 pi. But what if you have an unknotted curve, so then you have a you know that there's un, an embedded disk with boundary the knot. What kind of area bounds can you get for an embedded disk? And you can see in this picture, you might have to get some extra area to get rid of the intersections. And the result that, that uh, was in uh, some work that I did with Ligarius and Thurston is that if you just ask that question, there's no bound. So you can find the sequence of disks, or you can find the sequence of unknotted curves of length one with the property that the smallest disk that they bound has length bigger than n. So the nth curve in this sequence, they all have the same length one. So the uh, isoparametric inequality, if they lay in the plane, would tell you that they bound the disk of area 4 pi. But in, uh, in R3, you can construct these curves, and we'll see them in a minute, so that no matter what disk you take, the disk will have area as big as you like. So there's no isoparametric inequality in general. These are smooth curves. But uh, if you allow for, uh, if you require there to be a tubular neighborhood of a given radius around the curve, then you can get an upper bound, which is exponential to some constant, which is universal. And it's exponential in the radi one over the radius uh, squared. So it, the area grows bigger as the tubular neighborhood grows smaller. So let me talk about the second one. Uh, just for a, a minute. I'm not going to show you the argument for that. But you've already seen that, that comes right out of Hawkins' almost normal surface theory. Once you have a little tubular neighborhood around the knot, you can turn it into a polygon with 
a certain number of edges. Right? You have a smooth knot, and you want to approximate a smooth curve in R3 by a polygon. How many edges do you need to, to, uh, to use? Well, it turns out that what determines how many edges you need to get an isotopic polygon, one that has the same isotopy type, what you need to determine that is the tubular neighborhood radius. And in fact, it's, uh, it turns out the number of edges in the polygon is proportional to the tubular neighborhood radius. So it's just linearly proportional. So once you fix the radius, the tubular radius, tubular neighborhood radius, you can polygonalize everything and use Hawkins' theory to triangulate a neighborhood of the knot and estimate how many tetrahedra you get and use the linear programming, integer linear programming, to estimate how many triangles a fundamental normal disk has. And you can do all of this in a neighborhood of the knot, so you don't need to use triangles that have big area. You add up all the triangular areas and you get this inequality. So it's really just a matter of doing Hawkins' arguments again, but keeping track of the areas of triangles. What about, uh, so type one is, is uh, the, the, thir the first theorem where you get these big, these big disks uh, for, not, for curves of length one. Uh, that actually needs some new examples to be constructed, and I showed you some pictures last time. I want to explain why these particular, this particular sequence of curves, what it is and why it is that it's forced to, it has the property that disks with boundary these curves have to have very high area. So in the, in the polygonal piecewise linear setting, the statement is that these curves, the sequence of curves has a construction with 11 n edges, at most 11 n edges for the nth curve, but any, they're all unknotted curves and any way you have to fill them in with a disk requires exponentially many triangles. So let's see uh, how you get this. The way we're going to show that this has, that, that, that any spanning disk requires exponentially many triangles is we're going to look at this uh, axis that goes through the center of these curves. So that's indicated by the red line. And we're going to show that any disk that spans this curve must intersect that red line at least two to the n times. Okay, so I'm going to show you why that's true. Once you see that there's a line that a disk has to intersect two to the n times, then you know it has to have at least two to the n triangles, right? Because any triangle crosses that red line at most once. So that's our scheme. We're going to show that any spanning disk crosses that red line at least two to the n times. And this was the motivation for the, for the argument, and we'll see how that comes up. So let me first describe what this sequence of curves is. I've drawn the first three of the first nine, actually, here. And here's the construction. You start with a braid. And this braid alpha is just the product of two braid generators, sigma 1 and sigma 2 inverse. So this is a braid on four strings. Sigma 1 says take the first two strings and do a, uh, a counterclockwise twist. And sigma 2 inverse, you do a clockwise twist on the second and the third. So that's the braid alpha. And we're just going to use iterates of alpha and its inverse to construct these knots. So the idea is with Kn, with K3, for example, I'll iterate alpha three times, and then I'll iterate. So you'll see this braid three times near the top, and then it's inverse three times. And then I'll just cap off. So when I do it no times, you see there's a non knot there. But the alpha and alpha, alpha to the n and alpha to the minus n cancel. So you always get an unknot when you do this. 
Right? So if you look in the middle level, you can see that there's a bygone there, which you can cancel you by a right of Meister two move, and then you can keep doing that. So, so actually, uh, rather interestingly, you don't need that many right of Meister moves to simplify these. Just a linear number. Even though the disk, which is spanning the, the knot, has exponentially many triangles. So w one lesson from these examples is that the spanning disk doesn't give you a good guide for how to do right of Meister moves. Here's a more precise description of how we set these up, but you can see there's an alpha on the top, above z equals, so it's set up symmetrically above, around the plane z equals zero, which we th think of as the xy plane. The y-axis is going to be piercing through the middle, and it's going to be intersecting this, any spanning disk in 2 to the n times. So the idea of how to construct these is, first I'm going to, tell, I'm going to show you one disk that has boundary this, cur this curve and convince you that that particular disk crosses the, that central line 2 to the n times. And then we'll argue that no other disk can do better. OK, so th this is, I should say that there was a pr previous uh, published proof of this by one of the co-authors who worked with us on this, Jack Snowing, had published the proof earlier, uh, had published an argument earlier, but, but his argument that no other disk could do better was, was, uh, had a gap in it. So uh, we gave a different uh, example here where it was possible to prove that no other disk can do better. Showing that nothing can do better is, is the is what makes lower bound arguments difficult usually. But this, for this particular problem, it turns out Morse theory uh, gives us a simple argument. So let me just quickly indicate how it goes. So we had this curve, we had this braid alpha, and associated, associated to alpha is a diffeomorphism of the four punctured disk. Right, so you can think of taking alpha, a disk at the top of alpha, which is punctured by it at four points, and just pushing that down to the bottom. And as you do that, the four points, the four punctured points move around, and they wind up interchanging. They wind up permuting. And so they define some homeomorphism of the disk with four points to itself, which we call phi. And uh, if you take a, if you, the, w the way you will construct this standard disk is by starting at z equals, at the top of these knots, so at z equals one over there, the disk will just have straight arcs going across the, first and second and third and fourth uh, arcs. And then we'll just push these arcs down you, as indicated in the picture there so as to prevent, inter to prevent in, to, we'll just slide them down to avoid intersecting the, the knot. So they will, their images will be iterated by this diffeomorphism phi as we go further and further down the knot. And what we'd like to know is what the image of these arcs looks like as we keep going down the various iterates of phi until we get to the middle level. Now, it turns out that a theorem is a whole theory of understanding iterates of curves and how they behave under successively applied diffeomorphisms has been developed. It's called the theory of train tracks, and we're going to apply it in this case. And it's convenient to do it on closed curves rather than arcs. So instead of looking at the arc gamma over there, I'm going to look at a neighborhood of it, which is a closed curve. And we'll, under, we'll, under, we'll 
The question we're going to ask is, as you iterate this diffeomorphism phi, how does this closed curve delta and all its images, how does it intersect that equatorial circle, which I've labeled B there? So here we've seen that, here you can see that if you take one iterate of this diffeomorphism, that uh, closed curve delta goes to the curve phi of delta, and it's intersections with B is, have gone from zero to two. What happens if we take phi, phi squared, phi cubed, and so on? How will these, uh, how will these uh, closed curves intersect that central, equi that central curve? They will get more and more complicated. This, showing you some pictures here to try to indicate how these curves look. So to, to make it a little more precise, we'll look at a certain train track, and there's a process for finding these, but uh, I've just shown you the train track here that's associated to phi. And the, arg the claim is that if you take one of these uh, curves that came from that standard disk and look at how it moves as you move down, as you push it down, keeping it embedded, then it'll be iterated under this diffeomorphism phi and the iterates are kept track of by this train track. So if you see this, this arc alpha at the top of this of this knot, then as it's pushed down, you'll, you'll see at the various levels, phi of alpha, phi squared of alpha, and so on. And now, the claim is that these iterates will intersect this, this curve, this curve V, which separates the first two and the sec last two punctures in more and more points. Sorry, what is a train track? Um, right, it's, what is, so a train track is, is a tool that was developed by Thurston to study diffeomorphisms of surfaces. And it's, uh, it's something that uh, looks like a curve, except that at, various, at some finite number of points, you have three tracks coming together. So it's like a singular curve. And th there's a way of putting, so it's called a train track because you can, uh, Think of it as having some neighborhood like a, like a train track. And, and there's a way of assigning numbers to each one of the edges. Which tells you how many pieces of curve that segment carries. So if if there were three pieces of curve here, I'd put a three here. So there's a way of going from train tracks to curves. And the only thing you have to be careful of is that you get, if, if the number of pieces coming in here is equal to the number of pieces going out there, then you can reconstruct the curve from the train track. Uh, so th these are extensively studied in uh, understanding the diffeomorphisms of surfaces. So. You don't, you don't need to know too much about them. They, they, uh, they do have one wonderful property. If I have a curve and I want to understand how it iterates under what happens to it as I successively apply a diffeomorphism of a surface more and more, then it's, it's hard just using curve technology to keep track of that because a curve will get taken to a different curve which will be taken to a different curve and so on. But if I enlarge the set of things I look at to train tracks, like I do here, let me jump ahead a little bit, then you'll see that under this, what I can check is that under this diffeomorphism phi, this train track is actually taken to itself. So if you haven't seen train tracks before, this is maybe something you could take away from this example. So Let's look at the, uh, what's happening. We start with that train track at the top left, and we applied a braid element which 
interchanged the first two elements of it just changed it just did a twist interchanging the first and second holes right so the first thing the first uh, the the first this alpha was was a product of first sigma 1 and then sigma 2 inverse. So what does sigma 1 do? It takes those first two holes and it gives them a 180 degree twist counterclockwise. And so if you look at what happened to that train track when you did that when I did that 180 degree twist, the part that went around the leftmost hole was twisted around to go in around the center there. And the one that went around the center was pushed off to the left. So you sh if you think about it for a while, you'll see the picture at the top right is the effect of doing sigma 1. But now you can see the advantage of a train track. If you were working with curves, this, now you'd have a more complicated curves, curve. But if you're working with train tracks, you can push that curve down back onto the original train track. So you get the same object, only with different numbers associated to it. And when we go through the whole process where the same applies for sigma 2 inverse, we'll get the same train track at the end of the process taken to itself by phi, but with the numbers associated to each of the tracks changed. So you can study how the iterates of this curve work by studying what happens to this sequence of numbers on the tracks. And what you'll see is that the number on the lower left, 2a plus 2b, and also the number at the top that crosses that number, well, the, the number that, that's at the top middle that crosses that curve b that we're keeping track of, that goes from 2a plus 2b to 6a plus 8b, which is bigger than 2 times 2a plus 2b. So the number, every time we iterate phi, this curve, <coughs> has increased the number of times it crosses that uh, great circle by a factor of more than two. Okay, so if you haven't seen train tracks before, this is too fast to follow. If you have, this is very standard. There's, a, uh, there's nothing particular, this is just an application of the machinery of train tracks to study these particular curves and how they're iterates intersect that red curve. So since the number of times that this the iterates are, are the level sets of this standard disk, and what we've shown is that the level sets of this standard disk intersect this line, which is represented by that, uh, that curve B0 in Two to the, at least two to the n times if we iterate, if we iterate this uh, construction n times. Okay, so without getting into the details, this, this uh, implies that the red disk that pierces the standard disk right in the middle must cross that standard disk at least two to the n times. What's that? Because it's a straight, the way you construct this, I, it's not com completely clear from that picture. It intersects a neighborhood of that, it, that. You can put a ball around the whole thing and the red lines cross that ball in straight lines. So a straight line and a triangle, these are straight triangles. These are flat triangles in R3. So a flat triangle in R3 and a straight line can cross it most once. So the, the remaining issue after you do this construction is to, and this is usually the, the part that's very hard, is how do you know that there isn't some other disk? All I've shown is that there's one disk that crosses exponentially many, many times. How do you know there isn't some other disk constructed in some completely different way which intersects much fewer times? And the idea is you just look at a Morse function for such a disk. You say, now let's take an arbitrary disk and let's look at a, a, height, a Morse height function on it. So that disk is going to have boundary, this curve. And I claim 
that any disk will cross that red line in at least two to the n points. And the reason is that you can look, you can say, look, just when you start looking just at the level set that just barely touches the top of that curve, then you'll see something that goes from the first arc to the second arc. So you'll, you have these, uh, you have these two maximum points for this curve. So you'll start, and you have an arbitrary arc, so even when you're above here, you might have some circles of intersection of this spanning disk with this, with this uh, plane, but just below the two maxima, you know that you have some arcs. You can assume that this goes down here, and so you have some arcs that look like this, and those are the arcs we started with last time, and as we push down, we'll see the same thing happening to those arcs that we saw happening to the arcs in the standard arc, except we'll get, we'll get an iso, up to isotopy, we, we'll see exactly the same thing happening, but if you examine the pictures, you'll see isotopy only increases the number of crossings. We're, we always were doing computations where we minimize the number of crossings with, the, with that uh, what's drawn in green there before. So the only thing that could mess us up is if we see some critical points changing the configurations. And there's three types of ways that critical points can happen. So this is a little technical, so I just want to give the, uh, the, moral, the moral of the argument without getting into the details. But the, the idea is there's three kinds of critical points. You can have a, a circle joining to an arc or a circle splitting off an arc, or you can have two arcs joining together. So that each of those three rows shows one of the types of behavior at the critical point. And the first and the second type cannot reduce the number of crossings between uh, the, gr the green arc and the uh, and the curve. They, you can actually put a sign on the crossings and joining and splitting from a circle just doesn't, doesn't give you any decrease in the minimum that you saw before. So the only thing that really can mess things up is the third type of critical move, and that really can. That can, uh, that can completely destroy the argument. But now you use the fact that you're spanning this curve by an embedded disk rather than an embedded surface of arbitrary genus. And you show that in a disk, you can all, this third type of critical point can only occur once. If it occurs more than once, then you create some genus in, your, in the spanning surface. So it occurs once, either below or above the halfway point. So here I've said, here I've allocated it below. Otherwise, I turn the picture upside down. So the fact that the, it occurs below means that your argument isn't messed up as you go from the top to the middle level. And so the middle level still must have exponentially many crossings. No, it's, it, now we're taking a, the, the, the boundary curve is symmetrical, but the disk can be, you know, you can have, the disk can have, uh, well, so it can have one of these saddles over here, but not have one on, on the bottom. So the point is that you can't have more than one of these saddles, which has the, well, it'll be a little more accurate. There's a saddle on the disk that looks like this. You can only have one kind of saddle of that type when you have two maxima and two minima for a disk, for a disk boundary, just by Euler characteristic. If you had more than two, then you'd have some, more than one saddle point, you'd have to have some, uh, well, 
what would you have? You'd ha you could have something like this, but then it would uh, then it would connect to a closed curve rather than to uh, the the property that this that this saddle point has is that it connects two arcs, and you can only have one of those. So uh, I don't want to get into the details. It, it's uh, it is in a paper, so I can refer you to that. But uh, the conclusion is that in all cases, you must have 2 to the n intersections with this red line. And then just by changing the shape of this guy a little bit, you can make it smooth. You can make it have length 1. And you can make it wrap around some cylinder of radius epsilon, even, for, even as n goes to infinity. Okay, so by doing that, you can show that this sequence of curves must have, it, because it crosses this fixed radius cylinder in 2 to the n, in 2 to the n uh, disks in this case, it must have 2 to the n spanning disks, its area must be going to infinity. Okay, so it, show, it gives a con contradiction to the three dimensional unknotted isoparametric inequality being possible. Right, so, so you can see here that in this particular example I don't have a tubular neighborhood. So it's not obvious from anything I've said that, that the tubular neighborhood is required. But uh, that if you do have a tubular neighborhood you still, still couldn't make such an example. But if you do have, so this is this question, can we control the area by adding some additional geometric conditions? So if we do add a tubular neighborhood, you can get, you can get an upper bound. And the, and the reason is that you can then polygonalize this knot inside the tubular neighborhood with a bounded number of edges and then apply normal surface theory to get an upper bound. Any question? Or? Yeah, probably, almost certainly. There, there was nothing special about that braid. Uh, it was just the simplest one to, to look at. It would probably work for any braid. Yes, Claire. Right, so this shows that that disk can be exponentially complicated. That's absolutely right. That doesn't mean that the algorithm is necessarily exponential, though. Still, uh, the algorithm could still be uh, polynomial uh, because if you can find that, if you can describe that disk with the log, you know, with the number of bits in the normal vector, in the normal vectors. I, so the the I think the the, con the the result is that this vector that describes the disk, because of these examples, these things, if you have t tetrahedra, these really can be exponential in uh, in t. Right? These really can be very large. However, even if this one is uh, you know, if this one is 10 to the t and this one is 20 to the t and so on, you can still describe these in polynomial time, right? It doesn't, it doesn't take exponential time to write down 10 to the t. And, and it, it may be that you can manipulate these to, to find this solution uh, in polynomial time uh, also. So, so it doesn't say anything about the running time of the algorithm being exponential, but it does say that the disks that you're using in the algorithm really are exponentially large. Uh. How did you go from number of triangles to area? Right, so, so when you do, 
Hawkins algorithm, you try and you you st first make you start with a polygon, and that we've gone from the thickness of the regular neighborhood to a polygon. So to be a more precise statement, uh, I don't know if I put it. Uh, yeah, I actually have it here. So if if you have a a regular neighborhood. Which, is, which has thickness 1 over r, and the, the, and the curve has length 1, then you can turn it into a polygon with at most 32 times 1 over r edges. OK, that's a, that takes some work. But you can find an isotopic polygon within the neighborhood of the knot, which has 32 times 1 over r edges. And then you can triangulate the continue to tri triangulate the knot in a ball of radius 4. So if the, if the curve has length 1, then you can find some tetrahedra and drill out the knot and do this, uh, this polygonalization of the problem inside a ball of radius 4. And the number of tetrahedra can be explicitly computed. It's the, we got a rough bound of 290 n squared plus 290 n plus 116. n was the number of edges in this polygon. So you get this triangulation of a ball of radius 4, and now you apply Hawkins algorithm inside there. So all the triangles lie inside this ball of radius 4. They're flat triangles in a ball of radius 4. So their area is each, what, if if you have a triangle in a ball of radius, uh, well, it says here radius 2. But anyway, it's, uh, if it's radius 4, then, uh, then it's less than, any triangle will have area less than 8 times 8 times a half, which is 32. So maybe we did it with area with radius 2. But anyway, uh, so then give, that gives an upper bound in the area of the triangle just because it lies inside this ball of radius 4 around this knot. Other questions? Uh, so anyway, let, me, let me move on to the next example that I want to talk about, the next lower bound example. And this is back on the topic of knot diagrams that we talked about in day one. So what I'd like to do is, is show you an example of a lower bound on uh, how to compute the number of Reitermeister moves that are required to, to, to change a knot diagram to the trivial knot diagram. So traditionally, diagrams were used to study knots and links. They just represent knots and links. And we tried to assign properties to diagrams that don't change on the Reitermeister moves in order to get knot invariance and so on. But you can uh, change your point of view and say, you know, maybe uh, we should study diagrams as interesting in their own right. Sometimes the planar graphs with over and under crossings and equivalences and so on. And let's turn things around. Let's use what we know about knots and links to study diagrams instead of the other way around. And that's what, what I'm going to show you now is an example of. I'm going to show you an example of a diagram where you can't find a small sequence of Reitermeister moves to trivialize it. Namely, it's a, di it's a sequence of diagrams with n crossings each of which represents the unknot, but they're going to require n squared Reitermeister moves to trivialize, to turn to the trivial diagram. So you can define this function u of n, which for each n is, represents the maximal number of Reitermeister moves needed to transform an n crossing diagram to the trivial diagram. So the, fir the first bounds were gotten 
in work I did with, Ligar with Ligarius in 2001, the first explicit bounds on this function u of n. And the idea was simply to examine Hawkins' algorithm, which constructed a disk, explicitly bound the size of this disk, how, how many triangles this disk has, and then slide across that disk one triangle at a time, slide that triangle, uh, tri slide that disk whose boundary is the knot to a single triangle by pulling in one triangle at a time and look at what happens to the projection to the plane as you slide in one triangle. Well, there might be an exponential number of moves and each time you make one of these sliding moves where you, where you chop off a boundary triangle, you may create an exponential number of Reitermeister moves because you don't know how many pieces of the boundary are behind there and during this shrinking process there might be lots of new edges created. But nonetheless, even if you have exponentially move, uh, many moves and each move takes exponentially many Reitermeister moves, the product of two exponentials is still a single exponential. You can be pretty sloppy when you work with exponentials. So we got an exponential upper bound, but that's obsolete now because there's a much better bound due to Mark Lackenby, who's shown that if you have an unknotting, an unknotted uh, diagram, a diagram of the unknot with n crossings, then you never need more than 231 n to the 11th. Reitermeister moves to trivialize it. And what I want to show you now is a lower bound that I worked out in, with uh, Tal Novik, and that's n squared over 25. So I want to show you a sequence of diagrams with n crossings, which require at least n squared over 25, no less than that, to trivialize. And it's an interesting problem what you know, what, how, how to close the gap. The c constants here actually have meaning since we're working with a very specific model where we have Reitermeister moves and diagrams in the, in the plane. We, we could, we can actually, the, the 25, you could try to improve the 25 here, for example. We can, that it also makes sense, but I think my guess is that quadratic should probably be the right the right upper bound too, if I had to guess. So an, a good open problem is to try and even find the candidate example which would require more than n squared Reitermeister moves. And then you'd have to see how to prove that it requires more than n squared. So how do you prove lower bounds in this kind of problem? Well, you first find some candidate examples. So you look for some unknot diagram that seems to require a lot of Reitermeister moves. And then you prove that it really does require it by finding some invariant that, that shows that you can't do better. So let me show you how that goes in, in this case. This is the unknot. This is a curve in the plane that's unknotted. I'll show you why it's unknotted in a minute if you don't. It's not particularly hard to see it's unknotted, but I'll, I'll show you an explicit sequence. So I'm going to, this is a, a curve with seven n minus one crossings. This is D4. And you can see it's, uh, it's got four strands running around at the bottom uh, and the top and then just some twists, uh, half as many twists, twisted strands uh, running around the second loop at the top. And I'll sh it has seven n minus one crossings and I'll show you how to move it to the trivial knot using Reitermeister moves. So there's sort of an obvious thing to do. We'll, so th that was n there's n strands here, n is equal to four. So I just did n Reitermeister moves in 
sliding. I did n type 3 right amongst the moves at this stage. And now I'll do another n. And every time I do one of the sequence of n's, I can, of n right amongst the moves, I can undo one of these pairs of canceling twists. So you can see why it takes something like n squared with this particular sequence. Now it, it became a trivial diagram. And that took 2n squared plus 3n moves. OK, so what we'll prove is that we, can, we can't quite prove that it needs 2n plus 3 squared. But we can, improve, we can prove that it needs at least 2n squared plus 3n minus 2. So within 2 of the most of the optimal sequence of moves here. So the, the quadraticness came from the fact that we were canceling these, uh, canceling this bygone, this, this bygone at the right, which we cancel, and it takes n moves to cancel one bygone and get rid of one pair of crossings. So why can't we do better? Well, to do better, to show we can't do better, we're going to introduce an invariant of diagrams. So we call this I-link, invariant of based on linking. So we call it I-link. And it's, it's a map from diagrams to the integers. And it has the property that its value on the, on the trivial diagram is 0. If you take a diagram and change it by a right to move, then this invariant will change by at most 1. And if you look at the, di at the diagram we just looked at, d, d sub n, then when you evaluate it on d sub n, it's bigger than n squared over 25. OK, so that, that means since it changes by 1 for every right to move, you'll need at least n squared over 25 changes to, to make this diagram trivial. So I want to talk a little bit about what motivated this invariant. The, this invariant is called a finite type invariant. Finite type invariants were introduced for knots. And the property of a finite type invariant is that uh, it extends a knot invariant to singular knots. So singular knots are knots that are allowed to cross themselves to, to have a multiple, a double point, like that x over there, but only a finite number. And the property of a finite type invariant is that when you look at the two ways to resolve a singularity, you can push it off one way or the other, the value of the finite type invariant on the singular knot is the difference of uh, its values on either side. So these were introduced by Vasiliev and Gusarov in 1990, and they've led to some development of some very nice new knot invariants. The finiteness has to do with allow it, it with what happens when you take multiple singularities. If you, have multi if you have knots with multiple singularities, like two over there, then you again get, you resolve one of them, one of the two in two possible ways, and the value on the double singularity is the difference between the value on knots with a single crossing. And finiteness means that once you get to a certain number, like m singularities, then the invariance identically is 0. So that makes them finite. And they, they uh, actually can be used to study general configuration spaces. So you can use them to study not just the space of curves in R3, which is the space of knots, but in general, spaces of maps of one region into another, or space of some type, some types of uh, configurations of one manifold in another. So we're going to use it to study the space of diagrams. And we're going to construct the order one finite type invariant for knot diagrams. So a finite type invariant of order one. And that's what this I-link is. <coughs> 
So what we're looking for is, you know, usually when people look for not invariance, they look for something that's preserved under Reitermeister moves. But we want something that's not preserved under Reitermeister moves. We want something that changes under Reitermeister moves so we can count Reitermeister moves. And the trick is we want it to change in some controlled way. So the invariant we're, we're gonna, I'm going to show you here is the simplest possible one. and It's based on the linking number of, of a two-component link, which is defined here. You sum over all, you take the crossings. We've seen this already, I think, this week a couple of times. So I want to repeat the definition of linking number. So here's the definition of this very simple diagram invariant. You're going to take a sum over all crossings. Actually, this is very similar to the defect that Jeff was talking about this morning. You take a sum over all crossings of the knot, and you, take, you assign a sign to that crossing. And the sign is just whether the linking number is positive or negative at that point. So um, I've got an example here for for a simple diagram at the, at the left. There's a, a knot diagram at the left, and I've chosen it with two possible crossings to show you uh, what the po positive and, and negative crossings are. So the point is you can take, you, you look at each crossing, and there's a way of t taking a knot and smoothing it, getting rid of that crossing. That's what's happened at the right. And when you do that, you always create a two-component link. So here the components are AC and BC. A, the A component associated to crossing C and the B component associated to crossing C. And you can take the linking number of those two components. Okay, and take that, if you take the absolute value of the linking number and add one and multiply that by the sign of the crossing and then add that up for all the crossings, you get a certain number. And that number was, would not have interested knot theorists because it doesn't, it's not preserved when you do a Reitermeister move. Here's an example computation. There's three crossings for this diagram. We resolve each one of them, and we get three different two-component links, and then we take this little formula and add them up, and it turns out to be one for this diagram. This is an unknot diagram, in fact. And now you can check that whenever you do a Reitermeister move, this I-link component changes by at most one. So let's see how that works for this Reitermeister zero move, the one that goes from D to D prime. That's a plus crossing. So when we compute the link of D, and the link of, when we compute the, uh, the invariant for D and for D prime, we'll get exactly the same sum over all crossings. We'll get the same linking number for the two pieces, except there's one extra crossing in D that isn't in D prime. And that con the contribution of that crossing will be the sign, the sign of that crossing, which is plus one in this case, times the linking number of the blue and the red curve there, plus one. Well, that linking number is zero, so you're going to have one times one. So this type of Reitermeister move will change the invariant by one. And a similar sort of argument works for the other, for the other uh, Reitermeister moves. You just see what happens. You get some extra crossings when you do a Reitermeister move, and you see what can happen to, the, to this sum, and it always changes by plus or minus one, or zero. It actually doesn't change, depends on the orientation of the curves. It's, some Reitermeister moves don't change it at all. But it never changes by more than one. And it's very easy to compute. Uh, so for this curve, let's, let's see how, we're just gonna have to sum over all the crossings. So here's a random crossing how would we compute the contribution of that crossing? Well, we'll smooth the curve. That turns the diagram into a link diagram. 
we have to take the linking number of those two curves, but that's very easy to do. There's a 2n negative twist there, so that contributes minus n to the linking number, and everything else cancels out. So the linking number, I think, is minus n. It is, and that crossing was positive, so it turned out that that single crossing contributed 1 plus n. So you see here, even though there's only some constant times n crossings, we can get a quadratic sum because some of the crossings are contributing linking number n. And this shows you can't hope to get worse than quadratic with this. You can't get a better lower bound with this invariant than a quadratic lower bound. But anyway, it turns out that it, all the contributions sum to 2n squared plus 3n minus 2. And so we get a lower bound, a quadratic lower bound. And you can make this work for any knot just by sticking it on the side here. So for any knot, any pair of knot diagrams, you need at least n squared Reitermeister moves to connect them, even if they have at most n crossings. OK, so that, that was the second example I wanted to talk about. And then I thought for my last example, I'll show you something that doesn't have any, since it's the end of the day, it doesn't really have any substantial new math in it at all. But I, I just want to give you an exposition on, a, on an idea from computational complexity, theoretical computational complexity, that really is a, a mind-blowing idea if you haven't heard it before. It's the idea of a zero-knowledge proof. And I'll show you how zero-knowledge proofs come up in topology, in knot theory in particular. So I think this is just a suggestion that it might be nice, it might, it might be worthwhile to explore applications and connections to geometry and topology of things like probabilistic algorithms, quantum computation, approximation algorithms, and so on. There's still still a lot of uh, things that haven't migrated over to topology from, from this field. So what I'm going to do is give you a zero-knowledge proof that this knot is non-trivial. Okay? So what I'm going to do, or at least show you, convince you that, I, that I, there is a way to do this, I can prove to you that this knot is non-trivial in such a way that you'll go away completely convinced that this is a non-trivial knot, but you will, have no, you will have gained no knowledge about why it's non-trivial. So if somebody else asks you to explain to them why it's non-trivial, you won't be able to do it. You'll have no idea. So you'll gain zero knowledge, even though you'll, you'll be completely convinced that it's non-trivial. Sounds impossible, doesn't it? <laughs> The first time, you know, a after you see this, it, it, you get used to it. But the first time you, you understand this, it really, it really oh, sounds, sounds strange. No, that knot is not, you, well, you'll be convinced at the end, right? <laughs> we'll see. I, I think you'll be convinced that it's non-trivial at the end. So we're going to use three colorings to do this. So this is some, something people learn in the first in the first uh, course on knot theory, that you can color a knot sometimes. And the rules are that you color the strands of the knot. And you change colors only when you go under a crossing. Right? So you keep the same color as you go over a crossing. And if you can do that, with the property that every, at every crossing you use either all three colors or just one color, but you can't use all, th you have to use more than one color somewhere anyway. If you use all three colors, but you never see a crossing where only two colors occur, that's, that's forbidden. So th that's allowed because all three crossings have the property that you see all three colors at at each vertex. So if you can, if you can try color or not, then it's non-trivial. And 
the knot at the knot at the diagram at right is trivial and there's no way to tricolor it. So uh, this theorem is very elementary. All you do is show that if you have the trivial knot, all you do is show that if you have a knot and you can tricolor it, then you can still tricolor it after you do right on ice to move. So you just check the various cases. So it's a, being tricolorable is a knot property. It's not a diagram property. It's preserved by right of the moves. But the unknot is not tricolorable, right? The one circle, you can't color it with more than one. If you have no crossings at all, then you can only do one color. So it doesn't satisfy those properties. And you, you can show that that doesn't change under right of the moves. So it turns out there's a, Actually, some, this has been blown up into quite a deep theory. This exactly coincides with representations into the permutation group of the three colors, representations of the knot group. And there's a whole extensive theory of representations of knot groups that this is the simplest case of. But anyway, this is a, a very nice idea and I'm what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you that well I'm going to show you that this knot is three colorable which will prove that it's non-trivial actually I'm going to show you something even stronger a, a knot has a th strong three coloring if every single color appears at every vertex okay so there isn't any vertex where you just use one color and this this diagram actually has a strong three coloring, so we know it's non-trivial. Um, I can't explain why the background became black, but uh, anyway. Uh, so, uh, but pretend you didn't see that picture, okay? So you don't know that you don't know that this has a strong three coloring. I'm going to prove to you that this has a strong three coloring without showing you what that three coloring is. Um, you know, have, being three colorable for a graph is one of the well-known NP-complete problems. If you have a planar graph, you can always four color it by Hawkins, another theorem of Hawken. Um, but you can't always three color it and deciding whether you can or can't three color it is a NP-complete problem. This problem is certainly NP. I'm not sure if it's NP complete, but it's certainly NP because if I show you a three coloring, you can verify it very quickly. So how am I, I'm, how am I going to convince you this is a non-trivial knot without actually proving, without actually letting you take away any information? What I'll do is I'll, I'll do a little preparation in a, ahead of time, and then I'll play a game with you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to I know how to three color the knot, but I'm not going to tell you that. I'm going to do it secretly, and I'm going to do it six times. I'm going to do it with all six permutations of R, R B, G. Okay, so I'm going to create six different three colorings of this knot just by permuting the colors. Then we're going to play a game. Okay, and the way the game works is I will randomly select one of my six colorings, or you can, it doesn't matter. One, we'll, thro we'll throw a dice and randomly select one of them. And then I'm going to take it and put it on the table, and it's going to be, you're not going to be able to see the colors because I've, I'll have put masking tape over each of the strands. So you'll just see a gray knot of that type. Okay, so wherever there was a piece of the knot, a strand of the knot, I'll, I'll have taken a piece of masking tape and just put it over the knot. So, so you see this masking, you see this sort of masking tape that's over the knot, but you don't see the color of the knot. You just see the, the single brown color of the masking tape. Okay, so I'll put we put one of those six copies on the table, and now you get to do your move. You pick a crossing. Okay, so pick your favorite 
you pick a crossing however you like. You can do it randomly or try to keep a list, whatever you want. And you select a crossing, and then I'll peel the tape back from the three strands that meet that crossing. Okay, so let's see. You pick that crossing, and I peeled the masking tape back off the three strands coming into that crossing, and you, this is what you see. Okay, so you see the three colors of those three strands. But you don't learn anything about the colors of the other strands. They're still under the tape. OK, so what did you learn from that? If, 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 I did not, if I did not know how to three color that knot, then I may have just three colored some of it, and there may be some crossing which is not properly three colored. Maybe it's got two blues and a red. You might have found that if you were lucky, right? So the chance, so you learned, you, you, you got some information that this, with some probability I was not cheating, right? If there was one bad crossing, you would have had a one in a thousand chance of catching it. So there was at least some bounded below probability that you would have caught me if I didn't know how to do this coloring. But you didn't catch me, so I, I was able to color those three strands. And now we'll just repeat. You'll pick another crossing. Uh, well, first I'll cover it up with tape again. I'll take, put it in my collection of six, six colored copies, and we'll repeat the We'll repeat this uh, game as many times as you like. Each time, there's a non-zero probability that you'll catch me if I'm cheating. So the probability of me getting away with not being truthful that I know how to three-color it goes to zero exponentially fast. Right? So if there's a one in a thousand chance that, that you'll find the crossing within, that I'm cheating in, one minus one over a thousand to the end goes to zero very quickly as we repeat this, this game. So if we play all day and you don't catch me cheating, you should become convinced that, that I know how to three color the knot. But what have you learned about, could you show somebody else how to three color the learns, uh, how to three color this knot? See, you haven't learned anything about the coloring at that vertex because it could have been any one of the six permutations equally with equal probability. So you don't know anything about whether this is red or blue or green in a particular coloring. You only know that there's three different colorings of that crossing. So you learn nothing. So you, ha you have zero knowledge about how to color this, how to three color this knot even though you should be convinced with arbitrarily high probability that it's a non-trivial knot. So that's called a zero knowledge proof. There's nothing particularly uh, top, well this was just an example of a zero knowledge proof in topology. In, in a knot theory question. But in fact, these new, what was proven by the people who discovered this, whose names I think I listed at the beginning. Uh, so in, in the first paper introduced this concept and gave some examples. I think uh, three coloring a, a planar graph was the original example, or one of the original examples. And in the second paper, they, uh, these three, uh, Goldrich, Macaulay, and Wigdeson showed that any NP problem could be given one of these zero knowledge proofs. So I, in particular, you can do it for nodding. But uh, anyway, if you haven't seen this before, it is sort of surprising. So I, I thought I'd finish with that. And uh, I hope. Everybody did learn something this week. Uh.
Thank you for listening to the talks. <laughs>
So, for example, the coefficients of the Alexander polynomial are all finite type invariants. They're, they're just numbers. Finite type invariants tend to be numbers, but each coefficient, the first, second, third coefficient, is a finite type invariant. No, it's not true. No. The algorithm you gave to recognize the sphere, can you recognize other, other manifolds? Maybe not all manifolds, but some of them? Uh, yes, certainly can. So there are other algorithms also. Uh, um, so many, many manifolds are recognizable by their fundamental group. So, for example, it was already known whether two hyperbolic, uh, what did you could, if you, if you assumed uh, that a manifold uh, was prime and it had the same fundamental group as a hyperbolic manifold, then it was already uh, known to be to be hyperbolic, and and there were algorithms to solve the isomorphism problem for fundamental groups of hyperbolic uh, groups and so on. So a, a lot of manif a lot of results were known before. In a sense, the three sphere was the was not the simplest; it was the hardest because. Uh, Right. Uh, so, a lot, a lot of the other recognition problems split off, uh, re reduced to finding. Uh, well, let's see. What can I say? Well, w without saying something wrong, it, a, a lot of other cases were known. Uh, the three sphere was, in some sense, the last case. Uh, I'm, I guess at, at this point we know how to recognize any pair of three manifolds, I think, given after Pullman's, between three sphere recognition and Pullman's geometrization. I think that's right. Is, is Ben here? No. <laughs> yeah, I, I think we, now with geometrization we can, I think, recognize any, there are algorithms for recognizing three manifolds, aren't there? Solve. No, they're very slow, but but at least uh, the Pullman one is impossible. Right. But it's an MP. No. <laughs> no, it's far. It's much harder than that. It's it's it's. There's some special cases like not complements, which are towers of exponentials at the moment. Uh, well, I guess by Lack and B now, they're in NP, right, by recent work. Uh, it's, well, you need, you need some. It's easier than that. You should have thought of the Okay. But in general, the problem is we, do, we don't know how close two combinatorial structures on a manifold are, so it's not, uh, it's not in NP for, in general. Yes? Um, about finite type invariants, you said the relation to the Alexander polynomials are more finite, finite type invariants. Can you say the same about uh, the gradient dimension of some covalent homology groups, like the coefficients of that? Yeah, so, sometimes, uh, I think even for the Jones polynomial, the coefficients are not quite finite type invariants, but if you take certain combinations and functions of them, then they do become finite type or is renormalization. So, so it depends how you set up the problem, I think, in, in some cases. But I don't think that uh, once you get into more sophisticated invariants, I don't think it's true or not known, at least. <laughs>